hockey because it's a really fast moving sport and it's tons of fun. I like hockey because most of my friends play and it's really fun. It's so much fun skating and shooting. It's the best sport ever. I think what makes hockey unique is it develops lifelong lessons of building character and instilling confidence. Kirkwood is a close-knit community and what makes the biggest difference is the coaches and the parents that bring this program and this system together. We don't focus on teams and systems here. We focus on the individual player. And if, if he's succeeding, he's having fun, his love of the game and passion for it go up, he becomes a better hockey player, and then we get a better team as a byproduct. One guy manage what's going on, and the other guy teaches. We've earned a designation from USA Hockey. Uh, called a model association. There's only 11 of those in the country. We've awarded them this designation based upon their commitment to doing the right things for kids, uh, age-appropriate training, and really to provide the best quality youth hockey experience possible for kids at this age. We take a, a holistic approach to our player development, not just focused on the ice, but we also help them with nutrition, physical fitness. The purpose is to create a better athlete first before we create a better hockey player. And there's a huge commitment by everybody to put their best foot forward and develop the kids as hockey players, but also as good citizens. And that's something that will hopefully last for their life. Most importantly, we want the kids to have fun. If they're going to have fun, they're going to come back. There's a sense of community here. Everybody's working towards trying to provide a great experience, not just for the kids, but for the families as well. Once he started playing hockey and had those pads on, my little guy became Mr. Confident. It's just been amazing for him. We love Kirkwood Hockey! They're a, a, a model for us. Uh, at USA Hockey to be able to show other clubs around the country uh, exactly what our programming should look like. We in the States and the hockey community hold you in such high regard. So sincerely, um, to be able to share what we're doing, uh, I, do, I hope you don't receive this as, as a little bit of arrogance by any means. It's just, you asked me what we're doing, I'm sharing it with you, and I know you guys can do it even better than, than we're doing. Um, and you have all the resources in place. Um, a model association, what is the American Development Model? USA Hockey um, recognized that we as a country are underperforming. And we're losing kids, and it's a lot of the same issues I hear happening uh, last night and this morning. So we said, what are we going to do to put more kids into this sport and ultimately develop more NHL players and more NHL fans? Uh, we were talking last night uh, over a few pints, and um, every, every hockey conversation, if it lasts more than five minutes, tends to talk about the elite player and the top 1%. I'm here to share some things with you that I think help those players but also help everybody else underneath that. And I'll tell you a quick story about my nephew, uh, Cooper. He's a horrible athlete. He is super skinny, very uncoordinated, and he's my godson and I love him to death. But he's also really, really smart. By the time he was eight years old, he had quit soccer, basketball, and baseball because he knew he was no good. And he wanted to quit hockey, and it was, happened to be the year that, that we started implementing some of our changes. And we went to cross-ice games. And, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that, that the folks in this room are, are in support of the changes that Hockey Manitoba are making at the IP novice levels. You, you, you will be blown away by what it does for the kids. Not so much at the top. We'll, they'll always be great, but for everybody else. And that's Cooper. So... We make the changes, his sister, or my sister, his mother says, John, you're killing me. You want to change this game. He's quit every other sport, and last year he played full ice, and this year he's going to be the oldest kid playing cross ice, and, he, and he's stepping back. He's going to quit this sport too. So I assume you're all familiar with that kind of resistance. Even my own family says I'm nuts. 
I said, please, please, please stick with me. So three weeks into the season, and just like every other kid out there, Cooper scoring five and six goals a game, little Euro nets, no goalies. And uh, I had the ice the next hour after in practice with another team. And I said, how's it going? My sister said he just scored like five goals. I see him come off the ice. And, uh, and I said, Cooper, I heard you scored like five goals today. And he looked at me, he's eight years old, and he goes, I know, I don't know how I got so good. <laughs> he's 17 years old, he hasn't played another sport. He continues to play hockey, he still sucks. <laughs> he will never make varsity at the high school. And he is a lifelong hockey player and fan. This is exactly what USA Hockey and the NHL wanted when they, when they gave money to start this program. He will, he will, I'll probably be working for him someday. Brilliant kid. He will be a season ticket holder. He will play beer league. And, and he will hopefully be a coach. And, uh, and who knows, maybe his kids will get their mother's genes instead of his. But the point is, this is for everybody. All up and down your, your roster. And what, what the American development model is, it really just espouses age-appropriate training. So what are we doing? Player-centric age-appropriate training. Dean just kind of talked about it. You guys have the same plan here. So some of what I'm sharing is going to sound like old news. We started this in 2006, OK? We also started it because as an association, we sucked, OK? The, the stats up here, I, I want you to, to just bear with me for a second. It's really going to be hard for you to implement these changes if you're an association that's even moderately successful. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? What I'm suggesting is you can make the numbers do whatever you want it to do. Um, if you look, and I'm going to lump Canada and the United States together in this, in this, for the purposes of this discussion. Our two countries create more hockey players than anywhere else on the planet, OK? Yet if you look down there at Sweden and Finland, and with all due respect, uh, you do have a whole trophy case full of gold medals. Um, at the World Juniors in 2014, the countries rated one and two, Sweden and Finland. Canada's fourth, the U.S. is sixth. But you say, we win the golds, and we're producing more NHLers than any other countries. Again, when I say we, I mean us together. We're really, in this instance, we're in the same, we're in the same boat. We're killing everybody else at how many players we're, we're putting in the NHL. If that is the measurement of success, you win. Keep doing what you're doing. But if you say, wait a second, we've got... 500,000 players, and we're 37% of the draft. But the reality is, I can't even equate that far. One hundredth of 1% 1 of the kids we, we, we start out with are, making, are getting drafted to the NHL. First of all, it's a great stat to share with someone to say, easy there on your, your NHL dreams. It's kind of a long shot. But if you look at, at Sweden and, and Finland, and I, I gave up on the math, so I didn't even bother with Russia. But if you look at Sweden and Finland, they're basically double and triple as productive as we are at developing their talent. If Sweden and Finland had the population that Canada does, the hockey playing population, they would have over 200 kids in the draft. Now again, it's probably not going to extrapolate player for player, but you get my point. 79, 55, could be 150, could be 200 players. So if you say, wait a second, let's take a step back. Maybe we do have an opportunity to build a better mousetrap. Because again, I know that, in fact, I, I heard a quote from a, from a Swedish uh, instructor who was, who was uh, in the States with USA Hockey, and he said, if the US or Canada ever got their act together, we would be obliterated on the international stage. So there's a fear of waking the sleeping giant. And, and, and I'm excited that the giant is, is starting to, uh, to look at, at ways to improve. So how did I get here? This is Hip Hop Santa. He shows up around Christmas time at the rink. 
uh, with the kids. How did I get here? I, I am blown away that I am standing here today. And, and I said this last year at, at uh, Hockey Alberta, and I sat there last night, and, and if you were here, I mean, we've got some incredible talent on the stage, right? These guys are lifers. Senior hockey writers, GMs of clubs, Dean with Hockey Canada, everyone who's speaking here is a professional at this sport. How did I get here? And really, my message is, thanks guys, but, but you live it. I've got a day job, and you don't understand what I'm up against. I'm you. I am only here because I was a volunteer dumb enough to say, yeah, we should do something about that. All of you have the ability to make whatever the changes are that you want to make, all right? And that's really the purpose of my presentation. I want you to, to take away three actionable items. Lead passionately. If, if you love the idea of, of switching to cross ice or small area games, but you're, you don't know that you can be a passionate leader, find someone else who can. In fact, the reason Kirkwood got started on our path 10 years ago is because two guys who were much smarter than me had some ideas, and it, it was, who could we get to do this? John's dumb enough to do it. Let's, let's go show him these ideas and have him take it to the board. And they were right. I was dumb enough. And I represent a whole group of people. It wasn't me. I represent a whole group of people who were dumb enough to take it to the board. So lead with passion. Communicate frequently. There's been some great, great, advice that, that, that I'm going to reiterate, communicate frequently. They were asking last night, what do you do if we've got someone who just doesn't get that they're the problem? You give them the facts and then just give up on them. We're not going to, don't waste your time on the vocal minority. As a matter of fact, we helped people find another club who were, who were vehemently opposed to what we were doing. Not because, uh, we're arrogant, but they're spending a lot of money. Go somewhere where you're happy, and I'll be happier. And, and, and if you're brave enough to take a hit in the short term, you're going you're gonna to reap rewards in the long term. And then third, adjust regularly. Okay, The plan that I proposed, it's 10 years later, and we still haven't implemented all of it. There's still some things I would love to see um, us do, and there are other things that we did implement that we realized didn't work. So don't be afraid to fail. All right, so like I said, we sucked. I grew up playing at Kirkwood Youth Hockey Association. And I don't know if we sucked in the 70s when I played, but I know the team that I was on every year was competitive. So my, my vision of our club was that we were one of the strongest clubs in our, in our state. I came back as a, as a parent. My oldest son is five years old. and. Uh, this place was in shambles. And I do not focus on wins and losses in the least. In fact, I frustrate parents with how much I don't care about winning. But if we're developing talent, it is a decent measuring stick of, of how we're doing. So as you can imagine, we had a bunch of parents who were not very happy. We're, we're winning one out of every three games, and we're what? Uh, almost 300 goals against? A uh, goal differential of minus, what is that, 280? So that's when I said, you know what, I, I'd like to try something. And we introduced what we called mite development. So your novice division, we call them mites, 8U back home. IP, we would call mini mites, 6U. And mite development was said, well, we're going to take all the kids in 6U and the very bottom rung of kids in 8U, Cooper, we're going to merge them together so that we have enough players in-house to play our own league because no one else will play us this way. And I know we've got a lot of associations here that are, that are smaller and you're wondering, how can I make changes if the neighboring associations aren't going to do it? Um, or if one of them will, but, our, but our, our whole league or our district won't. Merge with somebody just at that level. So we, we figured out a way to create enough kids in-house to field our own teams and by golly, it was going to be about fun. We're volunteers, but let's be honest. We've got to, there, there are customers, and we need more customers. 
So everything was going to be in-house, intramural, because I don't trust anybody else to try and do it, what we're wanting to do. Again, 10 years ago, no one really understood this in the States. We're going to go to cross-ice games, three on three. And here's what we did. One of the things I did was I contacted an association in Minnesota. Minnesota is the closest thing we have to Canada, right? They got 50,000 players, and they themselves produce roughly 20% of the Americans that get drafted. Phenomenal model. Um, they also have the weather in the lakes and the things that allow for, for some of the shinny. But I contacted a small uh, a club up there that their high school team is way more successful at their state championships than they should be based on their size. And I said, you, what are you guys doing? And this was when we started talking cross ice. They said, well, how do you, how do, you do that? You want three games on the ice at one time, and you only have two benches. How do you do it? So he, you know, he laughed, and this poor guy, oh, he, he was so patient with me. But one of the things that we did, if you've got varying levels of talent to make up a single team, each one of our teams basically had three levels of kids on it. So that when we played our own team, we put the A kids out against the A kids, and the B kids out against the B kids. And then the two teams that were playing on this end, the A's and B's, their C's went out to the neutral zone and played. And then when they came off, the C's from the other end went out, if that makes sense. So each team had nine kids on it, three A's, three B's, and three C's. And that way we could match lines. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm coaching against a guy from my club. So hey, are your A's going out next? Yeah, yeah, OK, we'll do A's next. Um, Hey, I'm short one. Can I borrow one of your kids, or do you care if I have an A play with the Bs? We're in house. It doesn't matter. You know what? We'll work on the penalty kill. We'll play three on two. Just send them out there. I don't care. Send five out there. They can work work on uh, on tight spaces. So we do whatever we needed to do to get the game going. And I'll be honest with you, the parents might notice, but the kids don't. You know, they they talked about it last night. We can keep score. Uh, and the kids keep score, and let them say whatever the score is. I'll walk down the bench, and I'll say, are, are you guys winning? Yes, yeah, 12 to 1. And I'll go over here. Are you guys winning? Yeah, we're winning 4 to 2. They're, they're playing each other. So <clears throat> whatever you got to do to get them out there. We went to station-based practices. So I don't think I need to get into that. That's, it's pretty common uh, knowledge now. But it was 100% focused on skills. The best thing about station-based practices is that crazy coach can't practice a breakout with six-year-olds because he doesn't have enough room. So a station-based practice forces you to work on what is important at that age, which is skill development. And it also standardized the coaching. So one of the things that I'm sure is, is common in your club, same here, you can talk to two families that have kids at the exact same age, at the same organization, and one family will tell you that club is amazing, and the other family will tell you that club sucks. And 95% of the time, the reason they have such a drastic opinion is the coach. It's the teacher that your kids have at school. So we've got our double-A team, who's got a, a great coach, guy grew up playing, had some level of success. And then we have uh, a, a beginner team, a house team with a volunteer who's like, I guess I'll do it. And well-intentioned, but doesn't have any hockey knowledge whatsoever. So we moved to station-based practices. Coaches stay work in their station. Teams rotate. Now all of our kids get some exposure to that double-A coach. And, and they're not burdened, if you will, with, with a well-intentioned but less uh, experienced uh, instructor. So we rotate through the stations and standardize, help to standardize the coaching. It was, in essence, a training program for our, our less experienced coaches at the time. And again, no one knew what station-based practices were back then, so they were scared to death about planning the practices. So I planned them for the first couple of months, and then we phased them in, and, and I think I'll mention that here. But, so we designed this again as a group. It wasn't just me, but we designed it as a coaches committee. I took, I took our, our proposal to the board. They said, done. 
If you're crazy enough to run with it, God bless you. My term's up at the end of this year anyway. And then we had membership education, and we talked about, about communicating. We had, in essence, two town hall meetings, and we had a whole bunch of people sitting there like this. And, and we said, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it. And there is tons of information out there. If you need it, I can share it with you. Hockey Canada has it. Hockey Manitoba has it on, on the increased level of, of touches that we're trying to get, the number of repetitions that we're trying to get, the, just getting kids moving. It, it was funny. My oldest was in Learn to Play, and, and I was first time back. And I had this masterful 45-minute practice plan. And the kids walked out, and the first kid stepped out and fell down, and the domino of six more kids behind him. And I looked at this practice plan, and I just politely went over and threw it over the boards and went, oh, my God, what am I doing? We had them all lined up in the cones in a nice line. And I was, I was coaching Learn to Play for the parents. I wanted to know their kids were in good hands. I'm so smart, and it's very structured, and they're all moving, and they're marching like little soldiers. Isn't it awesome? And two years later, USA Hockey comes in, and they're like, what is this practice plan? And I said, isn't it great? And they said, there's seven kids waiting in line. There's one kid doing the drill, and that kid's over there doing snow angels in the corner because they're bored. I said, yeah, but, but they're, they're, they're learning, and the parents know they're in good hands. And they <clears throat> immediately blew everything up, had the kids running around like crazy, we were taking those border patrol pads and twirling them like helicopters and knocking kids over and creating the kind of chaos that happens when they're in a real game. And I realized I need to educate these parents, but the more chaotic practice looks, the better it is for your child because they're not in a systematic game. This is not football with set plays. So my point is, educating the membership about what we are going to do, letting them ask questions, welcome their questions. You're going to have data. You're going to have facts to support that. And they have, yeah, but we've always. Fear of change, tradition. We put more kids in the NHL than anybody else. Why are you messing with our sport? Last night, we were talking about soft kids. Um, Give them the information and then move on. USA Hockey's one of the smarter things that they've done is they've tried to share their ADM message is they tried to convince everybody initially and, and they've since reeled back and said, we're only, we're, we're, the information's out there, but if you want, if you want someone to, to come work with you, you let us know and we'll be happy to send somebody but we're not going to try and convince someone who doesn't want to be convinced. We, we've got too many people that want to know what we're doing and why and want to implement, so let's focus on them. Same thing at your minor association. If they don't buy in after you've given them a chance to speak, just let it go. They're eventually going to, they're either going to leave or they're going to give up because you're, you're, you're staying true to your convictions. So, we implemented this, and this is year one again, 10 years ago, Mike Development Program. We've got a whole bunch of families who are really upset. Last year playing full ice, this year we're playing cross ice, and a whole bunch of other people going, I just signed up for hockey, and I don't know anything about hockey, but that's not what I watch when I watch it on TV, and nor is that anything that I see any other association in town doing. Well, that's okay. We're going to make this better. So we had a draft party. Everybody else, rosters just populated, put up on the website. Coach might give them a call or send an email. No way. Might development. They got special jerseys. We had six teams, so we used the original six. They got drafted. The kids came up on stage at a draft party, got their jersey. We made it special. You want to be a part of this. Their jerseys, frankly, were better than the regular club jerseys. Another great story. So. All of those of us who are coaching, obviously, one of the nine kids on our team would be our own. And, uh, and my son, the second son going through this, comes up to me at, at, at the party and says, man, Dad, I'm nervous. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I sure hope you pick me. 
I said, well, we'll see what we can do. I've been talking to the other coaches, and we're working on a trade, but, but I'll let you know. <laughs> so we made the draft party really special and got the parents excited, and they felt like they were part of something. And then we had skills testing, and I'll show you that. And, and we said, well, who cares about wins and losses? We're playing each other anyway. But we're going to test your children on some certain skills. The beginning of the year at the end of the year. That's what I want you to worry about. And as a parent, isn't that really what we care about? I mean, we do want our teams to win. And there is a misnomer that winning equals development. But you really are worried about your own child first and foremost. So I'm going to give you the information at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And then you can decide whether or not this format worked for you. So then we had regular big picture parent communication. Generally, I would send out an email once a month to parents telling them what we've implemented, what they're seeing, whether or not it's working, ask for questions. And then, like I said, first couple months, nobody wanted to touch a station-based practice plan. Um, so I, I provided them all. But the idea was to grow our, and train our coaches as well as, as not just the, the players. So after the first couple months, we got six coaches out there, six teams. Each one of you gets to do a practice plan. So every six weeks, you had to do a practice plan. That's not, that's not too much to ask right now. Most of you are probably doing it for just about every practice. Um, and and they, would, they would send it to me. If practice was on Saturday, I'd ask for it by Wednesday. Say, hey, you might want to tweak this. We've got four straight stations that are heavy on, on stationary activity shooting a puck against the wall, stationary passing or whatever. Let's move those around so we're alternating, getting them all moving, and then a stationary zone, and then a high intensity zone, and just little tweaks. So we would um, then include the parents to grade the practices. And that sounds kind of scary, but I'll show you again. If you, if you ask them to grade on the things you want to be measured on as opposed to what they want to measure you on, then, then you should be open to, uh, to, um, to their scrutiny. So here, here was, was a, uh, an example of what, of what each parent got after the initial round of, of testing. So we did all these, all those across the top are, are the drills, and then you saw your child's score. So uh, in the, at school, you wouldn't get to see everybody else's grades, just your own child. But then we had, for each one of the things we tested them on, the highest score, the lowest score, the mean score, and the median score. So you had some sense of, I really hope you just let your kids play. But if you do want to go take them to a public session and work on something, you can understand where their strengths and weaknesses are compared to the entire division. So and then, again, we would, we would send them. Uh, at the end of the season, we, do, we tested the exact same stations. and. Uh, we would show them then not only their scores, beginning and end, but also the improvements. Um, and we were having kids across the, the course of this shaving off minutes of time in, in, over the course of the season. To be candid, a lot of that probably would have happened in a, in a traditional half ice or full ice practice, but no one had ever measured it before. And when we were able to give them that, and they go, wow, OK, well, this is great. And, and most of them didn't need it because they saw it if they were there throughout the year. Um, if you are going to, if you, if, does anyone do kind of skills testing already? If you do, or if, if you're thinking about implementing it, I'll give you one, one great story. Um, second year in, we're at the end of the season doing our skills testing, and I'm going, oh my god, what happened? Like 70% of our kids are slower now in three of the drills we measure than they were at the beginning of the year. Well, come to find out, we had a different group doing the testing at the end of the year than the beginning of the year. And they had the cones measured a little bit differently. So the end of the year was actually a longer course. And that's why our scores were off. But, uh, so my advice to you is if you want to implement skills testing, I, I, I encourage you to do so. But make sure it's the exact same group measuring everybody within a particular age, uh, either a team or a division. Because if you let a, a couple different crews do it, 
they don't interpret the uh, practice plan exactly the same way. We gave parents a scorecard, and we said, measure us on these things. Stop worrying about wins and losses or how chaotic the practice looks. What's on there really isn't necessarily important, but it's the idea that I want you to stop worrying about this. Focus on this. Measure me on this. Am I teaching these things? Pull that out at any point in time. And some of, the, some of the sections, so there were multiple sections. This is on forehand shooting. Well, we may not really even worked on that that day. But there were other things that we did work on. Measure those. And I'm happy to take the feedback and say, hey, in, in that corner, wasn't just my kid, but they weren't, really, they weren't really checking to see if kids' hands were the right distance. Thanks for the feedback. We'll make sure. To, to run a station-based practice, you need a lot of helpers. So it's very easy for something to kind of get lost in the shuffle. We call them the turn stylers. There are cone pushers. They're the, the parents who, who have no hockey experience whatsoever, but they love to be out there and help in any way they can. So they don't know that they're supposed to be correcting something. They're just hurting kittens and keeping them moving or keeping them from, from uh, hitting each other with their sticks. So we did postseason results. So again, I, I talked about the scorecard. And then we had the parents evaluate the coaches. And again, I don't know if the, it's kind of common now, at least, uh, at least at our club in general. But at the time, we said, OK, evaluate us. But again, tell us whether or not our, your kid improved enough and evaluate us on that, on that scorecard that we gave you. And then we promoted, because it was phenomenal, the results. Uh, unsolicited emails from parents who were so thrilled with the experience that their child had, you got to toot your own horn. So if you got something good going, make sure the rest of the club knows about it. And uh, it, it helps keep those squeaky wheels. It keeps the ducks scattered. Um, and then you review and adjust. So mid-season, almost every week, but certainly at the end of the year, we said what worked and what didn't. All right, two years later, signs of a heartbeat. We're almost to 500 in wins and losses. We're almost to 500 in goal differential. Things are looking pretty good. So we've had two years of this. Most of these kids are still in novice. Some have moved on to uh, Adam or Squirt, as we would call it uh, in the States. And they're still playing, which is the most important thing. But yeah, they're getting a little bit better. But we said, what else can we do? What other changes can we make? I, I happen to agree that there should be an off season. My kids generally don't play hockey um, from March through July. Someone made a great point. One of the things that we did at our club is we have a conditioning camp. Jamie Compon, who actually coached one of the 17s uh, this, this year, used to be the video coach with the Blues and uh, kind of took to St. Louis. So uh, first, he was the assistant coach for the Kings when they won it, and he actually brought the Stanley Cup to, to Kirkwood. That was his day with the Cup. So he's really kind of adopted us as, as uh, his hometown. Um, anyway, he comes back every year and runs a 10-day uh, conditioning camp. Kids skate uh, eight hours over 10 days um, right before evals. So the idea is you really can take the whole rest of the summer off. Go play baseball. Go play lacrosse. Just get out of my hair. And then uh, there is something for them to knock the rust off and not feel like they're behind. But there are going to be folks who say, hey, we want to do something. So we said, all right, well, if you want to do something, and quite frankly, we're a public rink, and the rink manager's got ice that he's committing the club to buy. If we want the good ice in the winter, we've got to buy some of the ice in the summer. What can we do with it? So we're going to take this three-on-three cross-ice thing that we were doing at, at eight and under, and we're going to, we're, in the summer, we're going to introduce it to the, the uh, Adams and the, and the Peewees. So again, eight years ago, that was kind of foreign, and the kids loved it. So we had three-on-three -three summer, completely optional. Um, for the first time, we, 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 we more or less had a professional coaching director. Everybody's a volunteer at our organization. 
And this guy's not even full time. We can't afford him full time. But we hired someone uh, to um, work with our coaches. And we had these divisional skill nights. So we couldn't afford him full time. So we found enough ice on Mondays and Tuesdays that every one of our kids in the club could get, their team could have a practice one of those two days. So if we funnel them through in those two nights, we can afford it at least once a week, 100% skills focused with a professional instructor. We talked about uh, reviewing and um, making changes. It was a little bit of a disaster. We had 60 peewees out there together because that was our whole peewee division. Turns out that was a little too much to, to, to put on the plate. Um, so we adjusted, and, and that's what I'm, what I'm hoping you can get to is a culture where we'll make changes, we'll admit we made mistakes, and we'll correct. The idea was good, the execution, we just had too many bodies out there. Fast forward two more years, we're four years into this process, and everybody else in St. Louis is now saying, what in the hell is going on at Kirkwood? We're winning two out of every three games. Our goal differential is now, what, 360. So in four years' time, we've made almost a 700 goal correction. And we've gone from losing two out of three to winning two out of three. At that point, I think people said, hey, you guys, that, this might not be a bad idea. So Missouri hockey, our, our division affiliate, it would, it would be like uh, Hockey Alberta here, or Manitoba, excuse me. Um, they said, you know what? Everybody's going to cross ice. This is crazy. We got to do something about what's going on over there. So everyone went to cross ice at eight and under, and that's, that's kind of where it started and it, it's continued um, for the last five years. Um, but we said, you know what? We're, we're, we're doing it, and actually, my oldest is a goalie, and that's what made me realize how horrible I was as, a, as an instructor for the goalies. You know, put them in the net, stop the pucks. So we, we started to um, invite a professional instructor to come work with our goalies roughly once every three or four weeks. If you're not doing that, I strongly suggest you do it, and here's how you make it pay for itself. Every one of our goalies, if you come to our uh, goalie skill night, it's free but you have to bring a shooter with you. And that's not your younger brother, that's a coach from your team. And ideally, the coach from the team is your goalie instructor, but at the very least, he's on the staff. And, and I can tell you, we don't have a single parent in our organization that's qualified to work with the goalies. So we hired someone to come in and train them. But at least these, on these skills nights, those guys who are the shooters see five or six drills that are goalie appropriate. And we tell them, you're, you're shooting on your goalie, follow him around, learn this drill, and now you've got what you need for the next four weeks until the next goalie instruction. So just do these over and over again. And even if they only do them half right, it's still twice as good as it was when it was nothing. So make that, make that skill instructor pay, uh, pay for himself by using it as an opportunity to train. So we said, you know what? In addition, our roster sizes are too big. Every one of our teams, ideally, if we, we don't cut anybody. I mean, they make different teams, but if you sign up at Kirkwood, you're going to play at Kirkwood, and I'm sure it's like that here as well. No one gets cut, but ideally, our roster sizes are the bare minimum that they need to be for that age group. So at, at Eight, at 10U and 12U, uh, 10U, ideally it's 10 kids on a team. We were playing with 15. We play other teams, 17 kids at a game. How much fun is that? The kid gets like three shifts and the period's over. We go every other shift. Somebody's going to get sick. They're going to get hurt. Yes, double shift another kid. Parents going, we would have won that tournament, but we ran out of gas in the third period. Awesome. You're complaining because you got too much ice? Is that what I'm hearing? OK, I just want to be clear. So a smaller roster size you can possibly live with. And then we, we went to three team practices. So if you've got 15 
atoms on a team. You shrink that to 10. Well, if you add a third team, you're back to 30 kids on the ice. That's what you were at before. Three team practices as a coach, let me tell you, they're a dream. Once you get over the, what do I do with, I don't have my own area. Well, first of all, you're running late from work and you're stressed out because in the old format, you had to figure out how these kids were not going to kill themselves for three minutes till you got there. Well, now there's more coaches because there's three teams out there rather than two, so someone can fill in for you. Three teams and we're rotating practice plan uh, production. You may actually show up at the rink and not have to have thought of a practice plan and figured out when during your day you were going to design that. So the three-team format, station-based practice, and then generally we will end with splitting up the rink into three zones and giving each team their 10 or 15 minutes to do something team-centric if that's what they feel they need to do. So you still have the ability to, um, to create some chemistry, to work on some things that this coach thinks he needs versus being forced, if you will, to fo focus on things that someone else is telling you you're supposed to be focused on. So we provide a little flexibility in that format. Well, enough of a good thing gets out and forward two years later, and it turns out some other people are starting to implement what we're implementing, and we are coming back to the pack. I think it's great. Uh, for me, the perfect season is 500. I don't want to win every game. I know Ken said that last night. He'd like to win every game. I mean, as a coach, in theory, you would. But how is that developing anybody? My end goal is, is for one of these kids to be playing beer league with me. Then my short-term goal is that he's still playing in high school. The odds are if he gets through high school playing, he'll probably be a lifer. Or she. And if she's a lifer, I win, Right? So when you, when you have that kind of long-term perspective, one game doesn't really matter. One season doesn't even really matter. If we had a tough year, I've got, a, I've got 20 years to, or, or 10 years to mold this player. But anyway, so we're coming back to the pack. And I think this isn't an indictment on Kirkwood. I think this is a testament to what Hockey Manitoba is asking you to do. Because I've seen the way that some of the other clubs are implementing what we're implementing and they are brutal at it. But the format itself is such a great teacher that all you have to do is put kids over here and corral them and give them a puck and let the game teach them and, and, and they're gonna do, they're going to improve much better than they were before. So don't get me wrong, we still wanna be exceptional, um, but as, as our teams um, as, as other clubs have copied some of what we're doing, we're coming back to the pack. There were, uh, Dean mentioned a stat, or I'm sorry, Peter mentioned a stat last night that uh, if you were here, I don't know if he fully explained, if it made sense. Um, we have one AAA program in town, the, the AAA Blues, and, and they've had a, a decent level of success nationally and internationally. Some of those uh, players from like the 95s are, are, are about to be drafted. All the clubs in town feed that one AAA team. We have nine organizations in the St. Louis area. Our playing population, our club size, we are less than 10% of all the kids that play in St. Louis. On average, we are over 20% of the kids that play, that, that eventually make those AAA teams. So we are way over indexing in terms of the number of elite athletes that we are uh, producing. And quite honestly, when you lose that many, there's a sucking noise in your, in your club. It's hard to replace that many good kids. Um, we, we've got uh, at the uh, Pee Wee level this year, we, we've lost four goalies to AAA. We, we do uh, two birth years in a division. So, Basically, our top two teams um, in both birth years lost their goalies to the AAA teams. There's another reason that, that 
it's it's difficult to replace your four best goalies in a division and uh, and manage to uh, continue to be um, dom as dominant as we were before. So we try and educate our membership saying, yeah, I know we're not winning as much as we used to. A, good on them because if they're making their kids better, that's just better competition for us to play. And, and, and number two, if you'd like to dig a little deeper, understand that we're coming back to the pack because so many of our kids are flourishing and it's not easy to replace them. But always want to try something new. We cannot, cannot, cannot get satisfied. Bill asked me what, what's, what's the biggest problem in St. Louis, and I think for our club it's complacency. Um, Ten years ago when I started, I remember evals and the eerie, just nasty feeling in the building of the scrutiny of the parents. There is a trust factor now that, that evals are, are kind of like, hey, it's hockey time, we can start tailgating again. You know, so there is, there is a trust factor which I appreciate, but that leads to complacency. So how do we continue? What else can we tinker with? So we went to small-sided games for all kids 10 and under, meaning all of our station-based practices, we did a much, much more concentrated effort of stop coaching, and it's a small station, but we're still, there's still too many cones on the ice and too much rote drill work. So more, more small area games. My development that we had, we finally said everybody else is doing it. Let's break that apart and let's rejoin the rest of the clubs in town. Um, so we're allowing our, our 8U, our novice, to, to play other associations. We continued with the station-based practices and the divisional practice plans, um, but constantly tweaking them. And then the video you saw is really from Icebreaker Weekend. So we talk about communicating regularly. Icebreaker Weekend is our chance to, to show all the new parents exactly what you get when you come to Kirkwood. So in 48 hours, we more or less give them an entire week of training in one weekend. So it's intense, but it's a kickoff to the season. We have a couple hours of practices, you know, one Saturday, one Sunday. We have a dry land session. We have nutritional information for the parents, sometimes for the kids as well. Um, and then we end with that big barbecue. And, and, and it is the most um, fulfilling day of the year. When you see, you know, our association is, is um, well, we're 342 this year. It's the largest we've been in a decade, and I'll, I'll address that in a second. But when you see 200 kids at a picnic, playing kickball, climbing on the jungle gym, just being kids. And all the parents are there, and we're all hanging out, and everyone's excited about hockey. Um, Ken was, was right in his video, in that video, when he said there's a sense of community here. It really is the payback. It wasn't why we got involved and wanted to make these changes, you know, six years earlier. But it felt so, so good. So we do the icebreaker weekend recognizing that every single year we've got brand new families in there. So, you know, we're, we're now 10 years into this. The Bantam parents don't, they're like, I get it enough with your preaching to me. Um, but we have to remember the, the, that, the, that the IP and the novice group, there's a whole bunch of brand new ones. So everybody's coming back and they've copied our mousetrap. What can we do to get better? The number one thing I can preach to you if you're not doing it is to incorporate dry land into your practices. Not every single one. And we do it, it's taken us about three years to get it right, but it's finally right this year. A, dry land is actually inserted into your schedule. So the parents, it's not up to the coach to make a last minute decision, can we do dry land after practice tonight or not? It's on the schedule. A, it holds the coach accountable to execute. B, parents can plan. And we only do 20 minutes. And if kids show up at the rink a half an hour before to get dressed, you know that they spend 15 of those minutes jacking around. So instead of being there 30 minutes early, get there 40 minutes early. We're going to do 20 minutes of dry land, and then you still have 20 minutes to get dressed. So it's really only an extra 10 minutes uh, inconvenience for our parents. 
And we don't do it before the earliest practice. If there's a 5.30 ice and it's supposed to be their night for dry land, it will be after. We're not going to eat into and make people have to leave work any earlier. Um, and, and we've moved to a single practice planner. One of the things that I mentioned early on was mentoring coaches. And we, had, we, we gave every coach a chance at the beginning. Every six weeks, every, every three weeks, they're doing the practice plan for, the, for their group. What we realized was everyone is focused on the right stuff, but we're all doing the same stuff. So we're spending a year all focused on skill development, but it's not building. If you have one person plan the practice for the whole division, and when, when this idea was proposed, I thought there's no way that our coaches are going to let someone else 100% of the time dictate what their practice plan is. The coaches were like, yippee! I don't know the last time I've had a coach say, I don't have enough time to do my own stuff. Because we still factor a little bit in, but it's a relief on us as volunteers not to have to design so many practice plans. But if you've got one, one person designing them for the entire division, we can take whatever the small area game is that we were doing in September, and we can add wrinkles to it in November and December, because that guy knows what was taught. So he knows the next thing to add, so that we can actually turn this into a neutral zone regroup over six months without these kids realizing it. So if you start implementing something along these lines, ideally eventually get to a single person who's responsible for a division so that we don't just focus on the right stuff, but we can build. Um, we realized when we shrank our roster sizes as tightly as we could that there are just kids who are more committed than others. And typically, they make the higher teams. They've been more committed for years. They're, they go to public sessions. They do the extra stuff. The house kids at the bottom, we wanted to give them the same amount of ice as, as the higher end kids. They're paying the same amount. One of those kids, one of those days, after these kids all go off to AAA, we're going to need that child anyway. But some of them are like, yeah, I like hockey, but I still play basketball. I do karate. Um, I'm in band. Whatever, whatever their other passion is. So we were finding that at the lower levels within our organization, actually having a, an extra couple of bodies on a team made sense for them because uh, they had more kids absent. Like, we... we we have a game and we only have eight kids show up. Um, so we've adjusted again. We went from big rosters to smaller rosters, back to medium-sized rosters. There's a monthly coaching syllabus. So the division guy is in charge of the practice plan, um, but he's educating the coaches. Yes, this is the plan, but this is the theory behind what I'm trying to execute. If you see your kids not doing it right, know what we're trying to accomplish and adjust. And then with the wonderful world of YouTube, we, we have uh, video training. So we don't, we don't film an 8U game and then sit down and break down the film. Jimmy, what were you thinking, turtles? <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we use clips and, and we show them things that they can emulate, you know, anywhere from uh, eight and 10 year old kids who, who are doing stick handling drills and, and their buddies filming it on their phone. Uh, just whatever you can find out there that reinforces what you're doing. Again, Hockey Canada, USA Hockey, tremendous number of resources as far as, as drill based things and videos to show that support that. So I, I've talked a lot and your ears are probably bleeding, but I'm gonna reiterate. I had a great, I had a great, um, boss who once told me, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I'm here to tell you what I told you, which is lead passionately. We have facts. We know that what you want to do is better than what you were doing. They have tradition and history. Share the facts and move on. If they sense your passion, they're, going to, they're, they're still going to disagree with you, but A, they're going to respect you and B, they're going to walk around looking for the other ducks and find that there really aren't any. If you don't have the passion, please, please, please do not try and implement something because there is going to be resistance. 
And those folks are going to try and wear you down. And if they win, you've set your kids back four or five or six years till someone else, till they age out and we can try this again. So don't do it unless you're really committed to doing it, but forgive yourself for the mistakes, right? Adjust. Communicate frequently. Again, with two-way two dialogue, there's buy-in. We, we said, hold us accountable, but measure us on these criteria. And then let's find out if we're not doing it, and we're happy to, to adjust. Something else that, that this is advice, I don't care what it's from, but it, what you do, take this with you. Don't respond to speculation. When I started implementing this and, and the, the group that, that, that helped me with it, we'd hear all this hearsay. Parent A told parent B that there's something that they had a problem with, and then parent B would come and tell us. And if you react to parent A's, A's you go to parent A and want to explain it to them, you've just reinforced that that kind of behavior is appropriate. So when you make these changes, you are going to hear a lot of scuttlebutt. If someone doesn't have the courage to come to you and, and, and address it with you directly, let it go. And believe me, I, I'm a very insecure person. I want all of you to love me. It really was hard for me to let people talk badly about what I was trying to do and not go to them. But if they did, I figured eventually, if it means that much to them, they'll come to the source. So communicate frequently, um, constantly on the team that you're coaching. But also as an organization, we need to be sending out communications about why we're doing what we're doing and reinforce. And again, it's coming from Hockey Manitoba. And, and, uh, and they're being provided information from Hockey Canada. So communicate regularly and, and, and do it with conviction. And then admit when you make mistakes and adjust. There's buy-in at that point. So if you admit mistakes, make those adjustments, we're constantly improving. And I can tell you that a byproduct of what we did 10 years ago is, is I'm actually at a club that does not fear change. I am at a place that is curious about what is next. Even if they don't like it and they disagree with it, they have been conditioned to know that we're going to try something else. So I, I referenced it uh, before, but this stuff works. We are now, who knows what that is playing, we are now um, the, as big of an organization as we have been in the decade that I've been back as a parent. So we talked about last night, we were talking about recruitment and retention. Dean brought out the great example of just pulling up the registration sign. I'll be candid, we don't do much more than that anymore at Kirkwood. And when I started, we were talking about folding and merging into a neighboring town because we couldn't compete. And the word's out. And our membership, the kids come back, they tell their friends. And, and what we're doing on the ice is now producing uh, our marketing materials for us. So I will leave you, hopefully this works, um, an inspirational story. Well, I think you learned a lot about leadership and making it happen. Let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under 30 minutes. To follow. Right. Sorry, now that here was, comes the first really follow with a crucial. To start over. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a Sorry. movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. 
Thanks. It takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So I would argue to you that, that, that the, the, the lone nut, Hockey Canada and Hockey Manitoba have, have implemented, uh, made some changes. And, and being asked to be a leader can be intimidating. I think everyone in this room has the ability to be one of the first followers in their area and take, take some of the mandates and figure out how to implement them and make it okay. There is a vocal minority that's gonna resist change and there is a whole large group of people that are kind of, eh, whatever. Those are the people that you want to get on your side. And now the silent major majority prevents the ducks and the wackos from getting in your way. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story with our association. We are supposed to uh, do a little bit of workshop, but... When I did this last year, I found that a lot of people wanted to ask questions because there's things you want to implement specifically at your organization that you're wondering if, if we try to tackle that. So if there are questions, I welcome them now. Otherwise, I've got a few questions for you. Sorry, Peter. Anybody have any questions? Good. I lulled you all to sleep. All right, well, I'm going to do some of the same uh, kind of information that, that Dean did. I want you to <clears throat> focus on your entry-level players, whatever you call that. And I want, I want to ask you if it's your IP, if you call it learn to play, what two changes can you make at that level this year to get you closer to where you want to go? Then I'd ask you to say, how do you measure that success? so that you can prove to whomever that it worked so you can make more changes next year. Because has anyone ever heard how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? It's taken us 10 years and we still haven't gotten to where, where I wanted us to get as a club, but we were smart enough to start at the entry level and then as they get older, make those changes because they don't know any better. So if you don't know where to start, I'm asking you right now to think about your entry level and two changes you'd make at that age group, and then, and then how you would measure whether or not those changes were successful. Okay? And then we'll spend about five minutes on that, and, uh, and then we'll see if we've got any good ideas out there. 
Is this where we cue like the Jeopardy music or? Two changes at your entry level at IP, novice, that you think you could make to improve skill development and the focus on the player. And then how you'd measure those to uh, determine success. Okay, I'm sure you, you're, you're either hungry or you want to get me the heck out of here. Either way, uh, anybody uh, got, a, got I, I love a volunteer or two to tell us what, what their issues are. We were talking about a good one here. If, if there's not one, I'm going to make them tell us theirs. But anybody want to share something they'd like to ch try at, at their IP level or novice? No. We were talking about football. That's Dean, and that one is time to time to cut it off. All right. Will you share what what you think one of your one of your problems is? You just mentioned it to me. Yeah. So the question was, if if they don't sign up with our minor association directly, if it's going through Hockey Manitoba, and then they show up, that wasn't what they signed up for. So <clears throat> for them. Um, what the, they were going to take advantage of the icebreaker weekend, that idea, and say, we know this is what you signed up for, but before you even see a practice, we're going to educate you on what we're doing and why, and we'll do it in a, in a fun way. We'll talk about it first, then you're going to see it over the course of the weekend, and then, and then we'll end it with the barbecue. Um, something else I shared with them that, that, that might work for the rest of you, and then I'll be done. When we first implemented that Mike Development Program, Understand we had kids that were playing full ice the year before that <clears throat> at, the, uh, at the novice age that were now going to have to play cross ice. Next year they were moving up to Adam or Squirt as we call it, and they're going to go back to full ice. So those parents were naturally frustrated that we were removing a year of their child understanding offsides, learning positions, how to play defense, whatever the case might be. So we said, you know what, we don't think it's important. We think y your child sucks, and it's more important that he learns how to skate before we worry about him uh, worrying about defense. But if that's what you want, meet us halfway. So through dumb luck, we decided that a third of your games would be full ice and two thirds would be cross ice. Many associations try and do that hybrid, and I think they make one mistake. They generally go all cross ice at the beginning, and then after Christmas or Boxing Day or whatever the, the, the breaker is, we're going to move to full ice because that's what we're getting you ready for next year. But what I think they, they miss is if you sprinkle them throughout the year, they get to see their child play today in a cross ice game and tomorrow or next week in a full ice game and then the following week back in a cross ice game and they realize how much better that format is. It's more fun for the kids, but it's more fun for the parents. So inadvertently, by structuring it that way, we got lucky. And by, by seeing them back to back on weeks, or coming into the building, and there were four teams out there in their cross ice games, and the energy in the building, and all the parents are in there, and grandparents, and then they're the next hour, and they're the full ice game that week, and it's crickets in there, because there's nothing to cheer about. It, it hit home, and we actually had parents that were, on, that were resistant and wanted full ice, Asking us by January, can we just scrap the full ice games altogether? The cross ice stuff is, is, is more enjoyable. So that's, that's a couple ways that you could, you could tackle that challenge. Uh, and I'll provide information. If anybody has um, questions, they can have my email address, and, and, and I'm happy to you know, help in any way I can offline. Just understand, I appreciate your time. I'm one of you. You guys can do this too. Just be passionate about it, communicate, and adjust. Thank you so much.